Happy Saturday and welcome to the Book Tribe. I'm um, just jumping in for a little bit of conversation and to let you know that the poll has been closed. It's actually still up, but in my mind it's closed. And we're just gonna go ahead and call the winner of the first ever, I was about to say annual, but uh, hopefully it's a little more frequently than annual, the first Book Tribe co-read the choice of book is, by a long shot, Camus the Stranger. So get out your little college copies or head down to your local used bookstore and head to the classic section, go past the romance and the science fiction and ask them where the classic section is um, or order it on Amazon or a books or a biblio or whatever your choice of uh, online book procurement is. Um, better than that is actually asking your your friendly neighborhood bookseller, obviously, if they have a copy. Um, but get it, and we are going to start. I don't have a copy yet, so I'm going to try to find one from a friend in the trade. Um, otherwise, I will be calling Haslam's in St. Petersburg or possibly ordering one online and I'm gonna dig in. And I know that it shouldn't take us too long, so we should be able to order it or start reading it or read it again. And hopefully the next time um, we meet, I will have read just a little bit and we can maybe start having a little bit of a dialogue about even the beginning. Travis, how are you? He says, let's get absurd. <laughs> exactly. Speaking of absurd, I can't believe that um, the, the first kind of five ways that I listed how to get the book, I actually said, you know, I actually said Amazon and and then Abe and then Biblio. And I really felt kind of bad about that. Um, call your local used bookstore. That was the first thing I said. And after that, you know, don't forget your library. You could also get it from the library. This is not something that you have to um, spend a lot of money to get. I'm trying to be conscious of that. And um, second place was actually, with a nice strong second, was Ficciones, the short story collection by Borges. So I love short story compilations. Again, it's that whole starter reader kind of space that I am in. And so um, I was thinking that I had a copy, but I don't, um, when I, when I, it looks like I'm just looking at the camera, but I'm looking across the room and right under Middlemarch by George Eliot, I see the spine. I was thinking it was Borges, but it's actually um, Lorca that I have a short story or short poetry collection of. So I'm going to have to find Borges myself. And um, Jennifer Lowe says library, <laughs> you know? Yes, exactly. I didn't miss it completely. It just took me a second or your local library. Um, I can leave that up for a second. Uh, actually, well, I am going to go ahead and pop on the the update here that it is um, the new co read for July. Stranger, which will probably challenge me because I get that it's like apparently very sparse and very um, you know it's obviously very philosophical and um, it may just go right past me. You know, I am not a student of that type of novel. Um, but I have some other titles that some friends were mentioning and um, I've been jotting those down here and there and I'm gonna put those possibly in another list as we continue to move through through our, our books and I'm getting ahead of myself because first, I just have to get through the first one. So Travis, you as I know are already prepared because you, you ordered yours. Anybody out there got a copy for me? That'd be cool. <laughs> I'm gonna have to find one. And um, otherwise, that's that's kind of it for me. That's all I really had to say. That I, that other than spontaneous conversation, I put some pictures in the uh, queue, and um, I thought maybe we could talk a little bit about the influence of art in advertisement and in periodicals and popular culture and things like that. But if I know that it's um, almost 10 o'clock, it's kind of a strange time on a Saturday night. But if anybody's about, say hi, uh, comment below. Um, here's the link. Um, I'm gonna pop this into the comments so that if you wanted to join, you should see that. Um, I think that worked. There it is. Let me do it again. There it is. The link should be there in the comments if you'd like to join. Um, a small update.
So on Wednesday, we were talking about the British Library and um, summer school that's happening this week, which is uh, a class talking about branch fiction and how that plays out in gaming and things like that. And a game came up that one of our tribe members has played. Mehdi A had, has played it and said he loves it. So I downloaded it and it's called 80 Days and it is really tightly based on the Jules Verne novel of the same name. Um, and it is fun. It's kind of it's silly. And I, I never, ever, ever play games on my phone or on any console or anything like that. Um, so it was really nice to kind of turn off the rest of my brain and, and play something that was just kind of silly and without consequence. That was actually really enjoyable. Um, if anyone's played it, I'd love to... I'd love to talk about it. I, I did enjoy it. And now when I hear references to Vern, I'm like, oh, yeah, I, I feel like I did that. I feel like I actually like sold the Amethyst and, and before I got on the ship from Rio to Dakar because I just did that for the last like three or four days. I failed miserably. I arrived back in London, uh, 26,000 British, great British pounds sterling in debt. And I think uh, 121 days is what it took me. I mean, it, I was not playing a competitive game at all. But the good news is that Fogg um, is keeping me. And he, I know apparently I was a really good attentive valet and uh, I got points for that. But um, man, it was crazy. Like pirates stole my pearl um, that I had planned on selling for a really good profit. Um, apparently just like in real life, I, I could not stop accumulating suitcases and I kept having to pay for additional baggage because there's always the hope that you can sell it at the next port, you know, and flip it and have some money. We had to go to the bank once and get another 5,000 pounds wired because, you know, I don't know if it was my travel choices or, or what, but anyway, it's by the makers, the game makers Inkle, and it's called 80 Days. And if you've read Vern and you know the plot at all, you I think you'd enjoy it even more. And, um, and that's all I have to say about that. So, I wonder if there's a video game based on The Stranger of any kind. That'd be interesting. Um, so, um, well, I'm going to go ahead and put a slide up. This is actually, um, and take the co-read announcement down. This is a political cartoon. It's an original. It's, um, it's really massive. It's probably about like 12. 24 by 30 and um, it's in graphite and charcoal and it's a set of three political cartoons from the, the from the 20s and I can't remember um, more details about it right now and I don't have it pulled up but I, I was looking at a colleague shop today uh, a big buy came in and it was a bunch of covers of puck and most people know puck uh, running from the 19th century into the 10s of the 20s. And the covers from the 1880s into the early 1900s, like 1904, are just dramatically gorgeous. Um, the artists that they that were working on the covers are, are brilliant. And of course, there's always a political leaning until it moved a little more into like, in the 20s, along with Judge, it moved into just like Gibson girls and, and pretty women on the cover. But it was squarely caricatures and political commentary in the in the late Victorian era, and um, but they're also gorgeous. Lots of Teddy Roosevelt, lots of Columbia and um, Lady Liberty. Um, the way that the artists chose to you know express um, kind of cultural stereotypes and of course political caricatures are both uh, an education in world history. Uh, helping you to contextualize kind of for somebody like me that doesn't exactly have the 19th century into 20th century worked out fully. I'm not a, you know, I don't know all my wars. I don't know all of my um, political science, you know, kind of inter intricacies from that time period. I have a general framework, but seeing a visual of it really helps bring it home in a, in a completely different way, right? This was for the general public to consume, not just political historians. And um, that got me thinking about the different, some, the, I just pulled up some items that I have in my inventory that are original art. And outside of being fine art, the consideration of what, how art conveys different aspects of industry, trade, 
compelling us on a psychological and an emotional level when it comes to advertising and when it comes to other facets that are not necessarily quote unquote fine art or even folk art for enjoyment's sake. So here's the first example, which is, you know, a political cartoon, which would have ran um, in a periodical at the time. Um, here's a, a more recent 1940s example of, this is an overlay uh, of color on a black and white background of a mock-up for a, some kind of an advertisement for the floral industry, say it with flowers. And um, I've got a little batch of these 1940s, just around pre-Mad Men era um, advertising culture and looking at the way that they used, um, you know, the female face and uh, the way they used typography, the way they used color to to bring people in and say what they needed to say here at Say It With Flowers. Um, I'm not sure what type of ad this would have been and how it would have ran. Um, it's a pretty, pretty simple ad. Um, but hi, Jackie, you found us. Yes. Yay. A lot of people have been commenting that I uh, don't always give much forewarning for Lucretia. Hello. I uh, don't give much forewarning when I am going to go on. And that's for a few reasons. That's I sometimes don't know. Um, I really would like to be somewhat regular so that we all you know, like know where to be. But sometimes I just... I'm working on a different project or I'm out or I don't have it in me, I don't think. And then I realize, no, I, I need to check in and, and I do this for me. Like sometimes it's completely selfish. And um, the uh, the main reason, though, that I don't actually do a pre-announcement is that is a, is kind of a technical issue. And that's when you schedule a show and actually have it be at a certain time and then that little announcement goes up. If you don't, and I have found this out the hard way, if you don't start and click start within, I think it's nine minutes and 59 seconds on the 10th, on the 10th minute turn of the hour stroke of midnight, turn into a pumpkin, you do turn it into pumpkin and it deletes your um, planned broadcast and you can't start another one for 11 more minutes. However, if you just, you know, you're just shooting and you just hit go, it lets you start whenever, and if something happens technically and you need to shut it down, you can start another one again. So that's my reason for just coming on really randomly and not giving, I give a tiny heads up tonight because I thought around 9.30 we would make the announcement about the book club. So if you're joining, the book that we are reading is um, The Stranger by Camus, and that is popular vote um, the real popular vote, not the alternative fact popular vote. Um, it actually won by quite a few votes. And second place though, and I am inclined to dive into this because I love short stories, was Borges' Ficciones. So I might have to, might do a little dipping into both. I have neither, so I need to get it. Anyway, um, the next thing that I just randomly pulled, from um, from pictures that I already had loaded into a Facebook album is, uh, I don't know if I've shown these before. This is a set of five um, hand-painted, um, these are baptism announcements that are obviously French and um, they're just gorgeous. They're like watercolor and maybe a little uh, acrylic or gouache because there's a little more of a dense co color in certain areas or maybe they're maybe ink and watercolor. They're beautiful. Um, but on the reverse, um, they're actually uh, have trade card advertising on the back. So they were French bicycle advertising on the rear with a blank c cover, which I imagine you would order and with your advertising on the back. And then uh, before you ordered your, um, you know, your choice of chromolithographed image on the front. Here, I don't know if the shopkeeper just had blanks and so she used them to show examples of the work that they could offer for customization for for, for cards. Um, I don't know if they were, I don't think they were really being used as the commemorative thing to give out because if you uh, we're going to go to the trouble of having all this beautiful customization with each person's name, I don't think you'd use uh, cards that had advertisement on the back. So I think that they were kind of like samples for it to show like, here's an example of what our artists can do at the stationer's shop that also maybe sells bicycles. And um, 
And so I think a pretty, pretty cool little Parisian shop that, um, that offered this artist services for your, for your little custom events. Jackie, hello. And to answer your question, um, you don't have to sign up for the book club at all. Um, the vote, the votes, the choices for the vote were crowdsourced from the group. And now the vote has completed and we're just basically going to dive right in and start on the choice for July. And, um, and off we go. And then when we have sessions, we can talk about, you know, what our feelings are as we move through the text. Fiona, right. I, that's what I'm thinking. You, you've had this, those before where the reverse, it's strange though, because they're so modified. They're the only salesman samples that I've ever had were more, you know, already done from the factory to, um, to show you like, you know, here's the 20 examples of trade card covers that you could have. But these again, they're hand painted. And, um, and, and even the way the edges like cut on the corner and then ruled, that's all done by hand also. And they've cut off, you know, the, the printed text, um, for the bicycle, uh, shop on the back. And so I really think they were repurposed. So they were vernacular salesman samples, right? Right. Art artisanal samples. Exactly. So it was, as I thought it was, you know, Madame Trousseau painting out her five and having somebody be able to pull that out as as examples if somebody wants to hire her to do her hand-painted um seating cards or giveaways at a special event yeah i love them i i i haven't sold them yet so i get to keep enjoying them um but they're really pretty so for a while and i still am really into um original art in a in a small format not fine art just things that your average person has knocked out or things that have been in the process of trade. I am partial to when it's in trade. Jackie, they are like 1880s, 1880s, 1890s. Um, they're not dated, but uh, but I was judging it by, I don't have a photo of the reverse, but the year that the bicycle that's advertised on the back, which is a particular model, the year that that came out in Paris and the year that that shop was running, um, Yes, I went down the rabbit hole of looking at the um, French business records and when the bike was kind of peaking in popularity. And I have it, you know, narrowed down to a range. Not that relevant for whoever ends up buying it, whether it's a collector or an institution or, you know, whatever, um, to have it down to the actual year. So I, I believe it was 1880s. And, um, and they're pretty, aren't they pretty? So um, here's another example of something that I might not buy again, except that I love it, and so I probably would. Ha! This is um, a, this is a close up, a, a cut in of an original um, pen and ink piece that is probably about ten inches by ten inches. There's no other advertisement. There's no other marking. It was just somebody doing work, um, and I wish I would have put the whole picture in because there's also another child in the corner. Um, and it's two uh, seeming Asian American children in a kitchen setting. And um, uh, the stove and the floorboards and the in the cupboard, you can see lots of pots and pans. And it really was a study for the artist in in like this kind of line work, you know, resembles engraving. Um, but when there is a, a an image or a vignette that somehow has an emotional resonance with me. I usually, usually buy it, but there's, it's very difficult for there to be a market uh, outside of collecting it just for enjoyment for things that are single pieces that are not, that don't really have a, a, a place to sit in. You can't bookend it with any kind of other like folk narrative. Um, you know, it's different if there's five of something or, um, if it's a known artist of any type, even if they are rather, you know, second or third tier, at least you can tie them to what city were they in. Um, this is no name. So uh, not a great idea unless you really enjoy a piece to buy something that is not at least findable because then, you know, who, 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 who's your market? Even a collector white might want to know that it's a Chicago artist or that it's a female artist from, you know, this era. So uh, kind of tricky on visuals alone. I try to stray from that anymore unless I just love it. And here's another example of something that I just loved and I do continue to buy. Um, 
let me see if I can draw, I'll drop myself down so you can see the art a little better. This is one page out of a Victorian sketchbook um, that is, uh, was unusual to me because it was done by a man. It's not unusual that there's, you know, a, a ton of male artists out there. We can get into the, the gender, <laughs> gender split on fine art on, another night. It's something I have a lot of ideas about. There's Chloe. You guys can hear Chloe the dog. She decided to join with her little bark. It's been quiet. Um, hopefully she decides to go upstairs or go settle down with the ball and not create a barking session for this whole thing. Don't know. Anyway, um, what I liked about this um, Victorian sketchbook, I think it's, it's dated. It was like 18, 1885 or so. It's about maybe 25, 30 pages completed. And um, you can see that... The, it's naive, but still relatively accomplished. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a good amount of detail and um, there's a scene where there's a piano in the room and a lot of, there's bookcases. I love to see bookcases in art. And um, the, it, was a, it was a male artist. And so often with Victorian self-documentation and scrapbooking and, and this whole kind of like hobbyist approach to, to, you know, pasting in chromolithography or sketching or, um, you know, memorial albums or almost always women, things like that. Um, I, I thought it was interesting to find such delicate work, um, kind of interior scenes and still lifes and things like that, that was done by a man. And I just kind of like the patina of it. It's a, it's a pretty little quarto. And um, I had a, a really like um, very simple utilitarian rebind um, done of the spine. The leather's now all nice and organized and not falling apart. And um, it's a sweet little piece. I like it. It has a name and a city and a date. So that helps. And this last uh, item is something that also um, it was it was inexpensive and I loved it, but no name. I can only guess the date by the type of the paper, and um, I'm. I f it felt like it was turn of the century to me, and um, it's kind of mucky and thick with crayon, and it's um, it feels to me when you look at it closely like somebody uh, who is either a youngish artist. Uh, or that somebody else, and this happened often, uh, sketched in the exterior and then let a child color it in. But I loved that the uh, the babushka and this carrying of product, this agricultural kind of family, you know, felt Eastern European to me and did not feel like an intrinsically, you know, urban or American piece. But really hard to to dovetail it into any, you know, kind of bigger narrative. And so as a dealer, uh, it doesn't make any sense, right? But I was really, really into and still am into um, found art and um, childhood art, things that are made by hand, um, even outsider art, you know, things like that. So if something feels accidental and not fine, I typically snap it up because I can, I can dig a little more for meaning later. But if there's a name or a date or a place, there's a lot more to go on. And there's Chloe. This might have to be a short session if she doesn't keep her happy on and she starts barking at us. P.S. Getting off of book news, I'll just uh, make the personal announcement that in two short days, this Monday, Chloe and I are going to um, obedience training. <laughs> and um, we are going to the local dog obedience clubs training. They have it at like the pet store and they have like personal trainers, but this is one of those really reasonable price for six or eight weeks at the local, um, it's at the local rodeo grounds actually, um, which seems like a strange place, but I guess they have room to run and do the agility training and do all the different levels of obedience. And so um, we are starting that on Monday and I will report back and let you guys know how that goes. And um, Jackie, thank you. I'm glad she doesn't bother you. And she, I would turn the camera and let her say hi, but the camera's fixed. At other times that people have heard the barking and been like, oh, it's time for Chloe to say hello. But she's not a lap dog. She's like, um, like a 40 pound Harrier mix. So um, 
Someday you guys will find a way for you guys to see her. She might not bother you when she's doing that little intermittent barking, but I don't know how many shows ago it was. She decided everyone was either sleeping upstairs or away. And it was just me in the middle of a show. And um, she decided to start like rhythmically, you know, unrelentingly do really, really loud barks right here in my face, you know, just off camera. Um, somebody who I think Forrest wrote later and said, do you have an eight foot dog? Because that's what it sounded like. <laughs> you know. But um, Jackie, these are, um, those are all for sale. Yeah, actually. Um, I haven't, I, I do share things that are in my PL, my personal collection. And I should actually show you, um, you guys more of some of my own personal things, but um, these are all for sale. Absolutely. Um, I really am partial to the, the hand-painted baptism cards myself. I probably paid a little too much for them, and, but I, yeah, I, I love hand-painted French stuff, you know, as much serious stuff as I do with, you know, um, heavy duty social justice papers or, you know, things that are really, really deep and meaningful. I also just like beautiful things and, and pretty things. So, um, I um, I sometimes guest host on a show that is on Saturday afternoons uh, called Bear Book Cafe. And they, we all who are participating were working with this um, quiz that went by on Barnes and Noble, um, the Barnes and Noble blog. I don't remember what month it was or if it was even years ago. It was last spring. And um, I pulled it up because I thought that I'm going to put the link here for you guys to all do it if you want, if you're so inclined. And um, I, I know I already did it, so I know what my score is. And I'm curious if, if anybody else, it is certainly not a what you know quiz. It, because I would not, would be winning that. It is a, um, how big of a book nerd are you? It's kind of cute. I mean, it's a playful, you know, it's a Barnes and Noble blog thing. And let me see if that went up. I just want to put the link. If anyone's to, anybody wants to click on that and pull it up on a different screen and do it really quickly, what you do is you just give yourself one point for every statement that you agree with or that is true. And outside of sharing the quiz, you basically can have up to 50 points. So, um, hey, Jesse, how are you? Yay. Everybody's up a little bit late. Um, West Coasters, it's really only prime time. And Fiona, good morning, good morning. Um, if anybody could type in right now, if you are, will possibly do the quiz, or if you would like me to just run through the quiz on air so that we do our tally, that might be, that's the nerdiest thing we could possibly do <laughs> is actually do it together in real, in real time. This is like as bad as me reading a multiple choice magazine quiz out, out loud and having, having somebody do it with me so that we can find out like what our, um, spirit animal is, but if anybody wants to, I'm game. And, um, and oh, that's Chloe at the window. Hey, Chloe. Um, so, so some of the questions are really like, we all are going to get these. It's, it's just like as a, uh, <laughs> Jackie stopped counting. Exactly. But what did you get to? So what did you get to? Uh, oh, not count, counting books, do you mean, or counting points? Yeah, it's definitely not just a contest for um, how many books we have. It, um, it, some of them are actually really cute. Like um, if you have declined invitations to social activities in order to stay home and read, or if you um, have a book organization system that no one else understands, that's me. Like, oh, points, okay. <laughs> Jackie says points. Beautiful. So if you got into the 30s, um, yes, exactly. Jackie, we're right there. I got up into the 30s and I think that's my maximum because there's there's a bunch of these things that I I don't I don't do. Um what, what I was gonna say, oh, organizational system. Yeah, my organizational system is so so mad as far as needs to be listed, needs to be photographed, it's over here, it's over there. Is this in a, does this go out to fairs? Not, I haven't been on the road in, in many, many, many months because of uh, an injury. But um, before that, of course, I had, I had fair stock and that's usually your, your, some of your best stuff. Um, but then it needs to get drawn back into the, you know, 
into the standard organization of the shop so that you know where it is when you want to bring something together for, you know, uh, somebody who's coming by appointment and wants to see A, B, and C. It's to the point that um, a couple months ago, I put out an all call and I'm still putting that out. Um, I haven't pulled the trigger on somebody coming and helping, although a couple of awesome people were, were willing to help. And um, I, I, it's that I'm at that kind of fork in the road in my business. I have been for a while where I actually really need someone else to take over some of the tasks that can help be supportive to the, some of the other things that I do. But the organizational system of the books is so nutso. That's one of the main reasons that I haven't jumped on having them come back and start, you know, helping is because I feel like I have to get my workflow in order in order for, to be able to let them help. That and Chloe, that's the other reason. So my friend who uh, I didn't write back yet about coming back to help, it's really just about Chloe. She basically, you know, until she learns to not bark at whoever's in the living room for an hour or an hour and a half, it kind of makes it hard. And Fiona says, we need minions. I need to duplicate myself. And Jackie, I do. I kind of know where everything is. And um, yeah, it's the stacks. And then the other thing is this. Uh, books are easy to organize. And books are, um, you know, easy and not easy. They are easy compared to, quote, non-traditionally shaped materials and to really, really flat things and to the smaller things get like the vernacular photos and snapshots and um, collectible art photos and plates, you know, engraved plates and things like that. That becomes really nutty. Um, when I do fairs, I don't like to use the notebook method. The whole, you know, it's the easiest but I don't like it. I like to have things face out and have each item like kind of stand on its own, stand on its own. Um, but in is organizing inside, it makes no sense at all. So Fiona, that's great advice. I'm going to put that up there. Jump, join the club. It's really hard, right? But just jump. Otherwise I'll never do it. So, you know, I have somebody who is smart and seems really willing to kind of like jump in and somewhat learn the, you know, even the, just the order of operations and ideally it'd be somebody who wants to learn the trade. And, um, but it's so disorganized and chaotic that I feel like I have to fix it first. It's like when you feel like you have to tidy before somebody can go over and help you with your house, you know, cleaning before the housekeeper. It's kind of like that. Um, Jackie says she finds it relaxing. Totally. Um, Yes, I think that, I mean, organizing it and, and working through on it when I like micromanage a shelf and really kind of and do it nicely, it is, it is relaxing, but um, I don't know. It becomes, uh, it, it, it is different somewhat when it is a, a labor of love and when it's a personal collection and when you have so many different segments of items because a lot of it, because you're running a business, um, and then there's the business paperwork and, you know, the, and then, you know, piles for um, things that are due for marketing deadlines or ad copy that you're trying to write or inspiration from the latest periodical that came so that you can write a blog post. I mean, it's kind of kind of ridiculous. I, I agree with you, Jackie, that just organizing the books themselves and, you know, working on like sleeving and cleaning and things like that. That's actually super lovely. That is the enjoyable part. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's, it's the rest of it. It's the, it's the rest of the shop upkeep that becomes kind of um, overwhelming because of the magnitude. And actually, um, I mean, I'm thankful because I am strong enough in the last month to month or two to dive in and, and, and start to consider taking care of some of these projects. So I am nothing but thankful. It's not a complaint. It's, it's not a complaint at all. It's just, um, part of the day. Fiona, as usual, I appreciate your wisdom though. And I'm going to listen to your advice. Just, just jump in. Right. So, um, if anybody is clicked in that link and is doing the book nerd quiz, um, go ahead and type your, type your total in, I will let you know that, um, where did the agenda button go? I'll put mine up. I'll tell you what I got to. I, Jackie, I didn't stop at 35. I actually, um, 35 was my number. 
So you win if you had more to go. And um, anybody else do it? Type your number uh, below, please. And um, so far, Jackie's the winner. Because she got up to 35 and she stopped. And I know if she would have kept going, she would have got to more. Um, okay, Fiona says... Exactly. The thing is, somebody who, I mean, I, I ran the numbers on how much more, you know, productive or a project that could actually get accomplished. Um, you know, even if we just, if they just scanned, you know, uh, 50 things that needed scanned. And so that lets another project move forward or lets, you know, a catalog get done. I mean, how could it not actually end up being a smart idea. It, 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 it would, um, I just already ran the numbers and know that it would make the whole engine work differently because we get to a point where, uh, we have to outsource even some of the things that I talked about doing ourselves, like whether it's marketing or writing about the trade or, you know, but I can't do that if I'm scanning a hundred new images of flat things that I got. Um, maybe only I can catalog at the moment until they learn but they can certainly do some of the other tasks that are supportive to that. So um, I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to now when Chloe, maybe magically on class number one, if Chloe can learn to like stay outside and not bark her head off at anybody who walks in the front door, then I'm going to text the person who was like kind of ready to help and hope, and, you know, wish and pray that they still are willing to. And maybe that is like something that I can actually be proud of initiating. That would be fabulous. I'd, I'd be super happy about that. So um, thanks for playing along. And if you are watching the replay, um, go ahead and that link will still be good. It's a static, static link. I'm going to take this moment that just got a little bit quiet as far as comments and, and let you know that this show is um, sponsored in part by um, the good folks at Bibliopolis. And um, they have built more than 300 online bookstores for people around the world. Uh, for over 15 years, Bibliopolis has been building online bookstores and software and custom software too, and hosting, um, and uh, also providing an incredible program, a database for organizing and cataloging your work, um, and that's BookHound. And they've been providing that for used and out of print and antiquarian booksellers for an awfully long time and just basically being the best in the business at that. And that's Luke and Mika and Matt and Matt and Bridget over at um, bibliopolis.com. And I will put the link up and let you all, um, if you're on the fence, keep in mind that um, I only wish that I had done it sooner. I can say that honestly. I'm reading some comments while I let everybody. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, sometimes it's just the right um, juncture to to bring somebody somebody new into a system. Um, but it is difficult when uh, you know I I have been doing this as a solopreneur for ten years plus, and um, outside of my daughter helping at fairs and helping like cut cards and laden slips. And, you know, back in the day when I was shipping a higher volume and a lower dollar amount, um, I was shipping so many packages a day sometimes, and she was helping with that. Um, but it is tricky. It's tricky. And um, probably a large part of it is me being unsure about delegation and unsure about actually like working with another human and, um, you know, that's a different kind of a deal than just than just waking up and doing your things on your own pattern and your own flow. You actually have to plan out what you're going to do that day. And I'm relatively bad at that. Um, so because if somebody is is going to show up, you want to be able to have work for them to do. And that's the biggest thing is when you're when you're you have to actually stop the train in order to train, even if it's just a minimal, minimal bit of training. Um, I've noticed some people are masters at just kind of gently onboarding people and, um, kind of letting them, letting them flow. And I just, 
I, I when I've trained people in other settings and brought other people into projects, um, I I'm a pretty gentle mom about it. Uh, so I, I'm going to be a little gentler with myself and, and know that I can that I can do it. I, I think a lot of it also is um, as a I am somebody who definitely wants to make people happy. And so I if if the person if, if anybody ever needs to be, you know, told, OK, we're doing it this way and not this way and correcting, uh, I think I probably am, you know, reticent to I don't know. It's hard. I don't want to manage people, right? I just kind of would rather do myself because I don't want to be the bad guy. So that's all like like tricky stuff when that you don't have to really consider when you when you just work for yourself and you don't have employees. So um Jackie asks, how about Chloe? Uh <laughs> oh exactly. And if I could outfit her with like a little saddle so that she could at least like move material from one side of the room to the other. Chloe the wonder dog. There we go. Chloe the Wonder Dog. She might be the first. She might be the first employee. Um, so anyway, uh, now that we know we're going to run with um, the stranger, um, do check in to the to the book tribe group and you know comment when you get your copy. I will I will definitely post the day that I get mine when I actually start digging in. Um, I'm also going to I'm going to write it down right now. I need to get the stranger. I also am really tempted to, like I said, dive in with Ficciones. And uh, I'm going to try, as I've been promising for a few weeks now, to make it a summer of reading. And and that's all I've got. I am, <laughs> I am, Jackie says I'm honest. I, I am, I am relatively self-aware and transparent. Yes, that's, that's me. And at this point of the day, a little bit tired. So thank you everybody for uh, listening and for commenting and for jumping in a little session of the tribe. Fiona, I have, hope you have a beautiful Sunday. Is the shop open today? Um, Fiona's in Australia and so she's about uh, 14 hours ahead, I think. And so when, when I do these nighttime sessions, she's fresh and sparkly and starting her morning and full of, full of vim and vigor. And, uh, and I am out of them in vigor. So uh, we'll see everybody next time. And I'll also see you in the Facebook group. Comment away and hit me up for any questions and follow-ups. I'm here. And I'm, I thank you for being there. Bye. It's not off yet. There's always this like extra, extra, extra.